Welcome to the Free Flowing Health Podcast, where we invite you to embark on a transformative journey towards a healthier, happier, more fulfilling life. Each episode brings you a dynamic exploration of the diverse aspects of health, wellness, and healing. I'm your host, Lisa Brown. Join me as I engage in intimate conversations with inspirational guests who share their unique stories and insights. These conversations will take you beyond conventional thinking, encouraging you to break free from the constraints of a one-size-fits-all healing approach. Our mission is to empower you with the knowledge, tools, and motivation needed to inspire real change. Are you ready? Let's dive in. Welcome back, everyone, to the Free Flowing Health Podcast. I have an amazing guest today. Her name is Christy, and she helps moms find more confidence in the kitchen. She's a health and wellness coach and is so much more than that, but she'll reveal that as time goes on. So welcome, Christy, to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I'm sure I missed a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, we'll get, we'll get into it, but I am a kitchen confidence coach. Um, and so I get to support women in the kitchen as they make the transition from, uh, a diet culture, um, sometimes very restrictive to eating whole food, balanced foods, balancing their plate, um, learning about all of the goodness of fruits, especially vegetables, um, and how their body, reacts positively to food instead of having it taken away. So I love what I do. <laughs> I, I love that. And welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank Excited you. to hear your level of expertise and your wisdom and your knowledge. Um, the key word of diet is die. So that should be extremely yes. telling. <laughs> I know that you, like many other people, have experienced some issues with emotional eating when you were much younger and eventually had an aha awakening moment. And people emotionally eat for so many different reasons, whether it's out of boredom or because they've experienced some sort of trauma, because they don't know how to express themselves, whatever the reason. I know that a lot of people have had a similar experience. So if you could just take us back to when all that was going on and, and paint a picture for us. Yeah, of course. Um, and food is such a an interesting um, almost coping mechanism, right? Because we need food. So it can be very, <laughs> very easy to get a hold of. Um, but as I was growing up, food was really the center of everything that we did. And it, you know, we ate it when we were sad, we ate it when we were happy, we ate it when we were mad and upset. And in our family, what I realize now is we did not really talk about a lot of things. Um, and if we were eating, we didn't have to, right? Because it's like our mouths are full, we're happy, food generally makes us happy. And so it became that uh, void for me that I could use to fill is what I realized. And so I was married. My first marriage was very young. It was a really toxic marriage. Um, and what I did was I turned to food because that that gave me love, right? In that moment, I felt good. It it was it was the thing that um, made me feel whole. And so I used food and <laughs> eventually gained a lot of weight. I didn't like how I was feeling. I didn't like how I looked. And I also had a five-year-old daughter at the time. Um, and I found myself a single mom to when our marriage ended and just coping with life really became very difficult. And again, food came into it, but there was that moment, my 30th birthday, where I saw a picture of myself and I didn't recognize her at all. And I knew that that's not who I felt like on the inside, but I, um, you know, not knowing really how to get there. That was really the line in the sand for me. It was like, okay, something has to change. And for me at that point, it was the food because I was not exercising regularly. That was nothing that I had been brought up with. And so that was not even a thought for me. It was the food and that's where I knew that I had to change. And so that really brought me into a whole uh, journey of just food, how I feel with food. Um, I traveled down a bunch of different paths as far as um, what you had said with diets, right? Be you hear all of these things um, until I realized that 
it's like the whole food itself. Um, yeah. So can you, <laughs> sorry, yeah, before you move on and talk about that, I'm just curious what the day-to-day -day pattern looked like. Was there mm -hmm. a particular type of food that you were attracted to? And I mean, was it a daily occurrence just for anybody listening out there who might not even realize that they have either a, a, an addiction or a pattern mm -hmm. or that they're filling a void? Um, you know, for me, looking back at the time, it was a lot of what we call comfort foods now. Um, and I, I still am, if I'm not <laughs> careful, I get very attracted to the French fries, um, like those, those fried foods, but also too, then I also love the rice. Um, like I love a good rice with like, you know, a sauce on it. Um, bread. I had a bread machine. I actually had to get rid of my bread machine because I was making bread, like loaves of bread. And I would just, it's so good when it comes out, right? It's this, it's warm. You melt the butter on it. It's like, like literally it's a hug from the inside if we think about it. Right. And that's how I felt eating those foods. So for me, that's what it was. Um, it tends to be more of the salty, salty foods um, than the sweet foods. I know for some, some people, my brother, it's ice cream. He can sit and eat a whole gallon of ice cream, you know, every single night. Yeah. So everybody's different. I think that's one of the things that you, once you become aware and once you're very mindful of it, you, you can recognize those triggers um, through, you know, through work and through, through the process. But yeah, that's what it was for me, the comfort food. And it still is. I'll go back to it if if I can. I think that, know, on, that's part of space. human nature, right? Yeah. There's a strong emotional component to overeating or eating when we're feeling a certain yeah. way. But then there's the chemicals and the additives. And there's an educational component where people don't realize that perhaps there is an underlining like physiological addiction to these foods. So I think, yeah. you know, it's multifaceted. Health is not just about, you know, what we're putting into our body, but obviously starting there, you had this aha moment. And at the age of 30, you saw this photograph, it, you, you know, you had this moment of awakening. So what were the next steps for you? I know you said that you, you know, probably went down the rabbit hole at first, tried a bunch of different diets. I'd like to <laughs> remove that word completely from my vocabulary, yes. but just take us, take us through yeah. that process. Yeah. So for me, what I, what I knew that I needed, because I'm, if you give me an inch, I'm going to take a mile. Right. So, um, I needed something very specific. I needed basically a plan of like, okay, this is what I can go shopping with. This is what I'm going to make for lunch. This is what I'm going to make for dinner because I didn't have any, I needed to feel in control pretty much of the food that I was eating. And so having a plan was going to give me control. And so that's where I learned to meal plan and meal prep. Um, and I made the switch from eating out to eating in. And so for me, that's actually where a lot of the experimentation came in as far as cooking and recipes, because I knew what I like. I knew the flavors that I liked, but I wanted to also be able to like to do that in my own kitchen, right? And in my own house and be able to figure out what that looked like. And so um, I did meal planning and I was a single mom too. So I didn't have a lot of money to be able to just haphazardly spend, try something, hopefully it works. And if it doesn't, then, okay, we'll, you know, we'll throw it out and we'll try something else. Um, so I went very specific with what I knew, first of all, especially with the vegetables um, and with, you know, with proteins, that's what I knew. So I went very basic and then I started to expand, but probably for the first, I want to say six months, my breakfast, lunch, and dinners were very similar, maybe like, you know, uh, chicken instead of salmon or like something like yeah. that. But it was very basic because I needed that at the beginning. I needed a structure. Um, you know, I needed basically a skeleton to work from. And then I was able to be like, oh, okay, <laughs> this, this works with this, this flavor works with this. And also be able to try different, um, different vegetables and realize that, you know what? Vegetables actually are pretty good. Right. I like them. <laughs> and a lot of people are so intimidated and they use the excuse that, you know, they don't know how to use a knife or it's so overwhelming and especially trying to transition to a, a new way of eating mm -hmm. and being and thinking and perceiving and living ultimately. 
So what was your skill set when you began to embark on this journey? Of course, you knew what you liked and you began to ex experiment and explore. But what would you say your skill set was mm. at that point when you approached the kitchen and started this new path? Yeah, I love that question. Um, and because I think a lot of us don't think we have a skill set in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, especially I was going from ordering takeout and, you know, or going through drive throughs and then coming in. So going back to the basics for me was really, really important. Um, you know, so like I when I say, you know, going to the store, this is what I bought. And then I came home and this is what I did. Um, very basic flavors because that's what I grew up with. So that's what I knew. So like typical, um, you know, pantry things, garlic powder, oregano, those kind of things. And then I became comfortable with those. Um, and I probably, I will say my crock pot was something that I used a lot again, because I was working full time. I was a single mom, but I got very, very good at making crock pot meals and also being able to double batch them, which I do a lot now, right? Because then I can use them for leftovers. I can use them. I can freeze them. And so that really became like, oh, crock pot. I can use that. I know how to use that. This is what I'll do. And this is what's going to come out of it, right? It's that set of processes. Um, so yeah, starting there and then being able to translate that into different, <laughs> different recipes. Especially, you know, all the busy people out there, all of the single moms, all of the people who have uh, so many responsibilities, mm -hmm. I guess I'm just trying to show the world that it's yeah. possible. Like people are intimidated, but you know, one step, one foot in front of the other, we can learn as we go. And starting with the yeah. basics, consistency, repetition is key to creating a habit and also big batch cooking. You can also freeze it. If it's, you know, something you're trying to prepare for, for weeks in advance, just pull these freezer meals. So at, yeah. at, at first was your goal just losing weight or did you always have health in mind? And in making these changes, did you notice other things begin mm -hmm. to happen? Yeah. At first, my goal was just losing weight. I was about 65 pounds overweight. And that was really, that was my goal, right? Just to lose weight. Then as typical, as we start to lose weight, we notice things start to happen, right? And we're like, oh, wait, I feel better, which, you know, then you tend to carry yourself differently because you're, you're feeling better. You're looking better. Um, but also just energy wise, I didn't have energy to play with my little one, like I wanted to. And what I noticed was then my energy changed. And so we were doing more active things. We were, I was able to take her to the playground so she could learn how to ride her bicycle and chase after her. Those things I wasn't able to do before. Right. So like just little things like that. And then of course, along the way, my clothes fitting differently. That was a really, I just remember walking by a store mirror or a store window and like stopping and looking at myself because my reflection was different. I didn't right. right. Like I didn't have the roles like I used to. I just didn't have those things. And that was something new for me. So all of those new things at the beginning are, are exciting. Um, but yes, you start to notice different things that you didn't realize you were missing before. Right. And I think when health becomes a priority over just losing weight, then people can be even more successful without an attachment 100%. to outcome. And then, and then you just melt off the pounds without even trying, just let me make myself healthier. Let me adopt these new habits. Let me just dive in and see what happens to improve my health. And I find mm -hmm. that with a lot of my clients, I'm a private chef, a lifestyle coach. I see it all the time. You're yeah. a fellow foodie. I love that you're out there creating more confidence in the kitchen, because I think it's something that's severely lacking in the society. Mm -hmm. We live in a society of convenience and a lot of people are still new to, you know, learning about whole foods yeah. and just feeding themselves, nourishing mind, body, and spirit, which brings me to my next question. Obviously food is one part of it, but I know you like to help women and it expands far beyond food. So can you yeah. speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So for me, it always begins with food just because that's where my, 
uh, you know, my change began. And for a lot of the women, as I'm sure with you as well, they're attracted to you for kind of those same, same reasons, right? So we start with the food and then we start to move um, outwards from there. But movement is huge. And mm-hmm. that has been something for me over the last five years. Um, once I began losing the weight, then that's when I started to incorporate more movement into my body because I was like, oh, if I could do this, imagine how much better I would feel or the results would be different, right? So let me try to do this. Um, And so incorporating movement, but strength training has been really big for me and I love it. And it has given me more confidence than I had before as well. And so what, um, what I love to be able to do with the women that I work with is We'll start with food. And then once they start to feel different and once they start to see the changes, then we start to incorporate movement. We start to incorporate walking, um, you know, light weights, even resistant band workouts. Those are like, we don't give resistant bands enough credit. But I'm all about it. I'm all about it. Yes. I mean, those are really big and even yoga and stretching and the things that we say that we don't have time for when in reality we do, and it's a matter of just carving out. So also to being able to look at our time, managing our time effectively to help us reach our goals, right? So there's, there's that idea of like, well, I can't do this because instead of being like, okay, well, let's take a look at everything and let's really see how all of that wraps up in there. And then once they start- So I just want to add that there's a difference between being busy and productive. And a lot of times people find find distractions as an addiction. They don't even realize it and they make excuses, but yeah, I'm sorry. You can continue your train of thought. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? And then even just um, the mindset, the shift of instead of saying, I can't do this, right? Then we say, I'm not able to do this yet. But with that yet, then that means that we also have to take action and we have to do work. So there are goals that are achievable we also have to take the steps, right? I think so many of our, so many of us are used to having other people do things for us, or that's where the quick fixes come in. And they're like, oh, well, you know, do this in four weeks and, you know, you'll lose 10 pounds. And then what after that 10 pounds? Like, what are your goals after that? There has to be something that we're reaching for. So I, it doesn't stay with food. And if it stays with food, um, then that's probably not the person that, is going to work well with me because I like to bring it so much more. You're like you said, mind, body, spirit. Um, our mindset is a really big piece into understanding why we're eating the way we're eating and what is driving us to that. So we have to be able to tap into that as well. Right. And the fear of staying the same eventually mm. is bigger, you know, has to be trumped by the fear or rather the fear of change is going to be lessened and the fear of staying the same becomes yeah. greater. So mm-hmm. it gets to the point where the universe is just pushing you, you know, it starts with that mellow tap and then eventually, you know, the universe yes. just shoves you toward the direction of, you know, opti- op- optimizing your health and just making these changes to ensure that, you know, you can continue on the path. Um, so if you could just take me through a day of working with a client, is it in their homes? Is it virtual? What does it look like as a kitchen coach? Yeah, I mean, it could be a combination depending on where they live. Um, I do have clients where I I go to their home and we actually do cooking. I've had uh, women that didn't grow up in the kitchen. And so even making something as simple to you and I as tacos is Mm -hmm. something that is foreign to them. But what they want is they want to feed their family well. Right. And so that they also want to want their family to come home and feel that comfort. So I've done that. I've done where I go into the kitchen and we start with the basics and then we move on to making freezer meals or, um, you know, different things so that they can get used to it. But a lot of times, even for women, whether it's virtual or in the kitchen, um, it is really just understanding how to read a recipe and go through that. So they're not anxious with that. Um, Surprisingly, 
you know, there are so many women that haven't grown up in the kitchen or weren't allowed in the kitchen, maybe, right? They have like the mom or the grandmom who was like um, the maternal one who kind of, who did all that kitchen uh, cooking and now they're thrown on their own. Um, I have a client who uh, virtually, she's like, Christy, I don't even know where to go in the grocery store to get that, right? That is something that for me, I take for granted, but sending a list of ingredients and like, <laughs> I don't know where to go to get this, right? So it can mean a lot of things. And what I like to do, I'm not a cookie cutter. Um, I'm not a cookie cutter coach, as I'm sure you're not as well. Yeah. And I like to get to know the their goals. I also like to get to know their background and where they've come from so that I can you know, tailor what we're doing to them. And once they get all of those skills under their belt, then that's a whole new ball game, right? Now I can send them to the grocery store. They can get what they need. Now we come home and now we do some cooking, right? Um, we do that. I also do uh, cooking classes in schools after school for kids as well. And um, that is so much fun. Talk about sponges and they just, they want to know, they want to try their flavors. They're not um, intimidated by anything. So that's fun too. So I do a whole range of, <laughs> of virtual in-person kitchens, schools, all the things. I think the world needs more of you. And <laughs> I, I, I always begin with the pantry reset and often yeah. a grocery tour, whether it's in-person or virtual, because mm -hmm. as you already stated, People are lost in in the grocery store, especially making these these swaps and trying to introduce yeah. healthier alternatives. They have no idea where to find the stuff, and yeah. you know, often people quit before they begin. And that's why mm. I think the guidance of a professional who's empathetic and open and who's been there before is super useful. And I can relate yeah. to having zero skill set in the kitchen until I was in my late twenties. I mean, I literally was raised on bad frozen food, the standard American mm. diet. I struggled with binge eating at some point, didn't even realize that I was addicted to sugar. And, you know, it took me having a health scare in my twenties. And then eventually literally doing a culinary apprenticeship in New York city, which is where I'm from to, Amazing. you know, re-educate myself and teach myself about, you know, using health supportive ingredients and being confident in the kitchen. So I think that anyone, everyone, including children, I mean, they're the next generation of leaders. Yeah. So it's important that they can feed themselves. It's amazing to me how many adults still can't, can't feed themselves. So kudos to you. I love what you're doing. <laughs> I, I even love the term, uh, you know, confidence coach. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, like, <laughs> last night, even I did a quick, my daughter had a play date. My little one um, had a play date and I made applesauce in the instant pot. Instant pot. I moved from the crock pot to the instant pot. Instant pot is one of my favorite things to do now because it's so hands-off and so quickly, so quick. But her friend was like enamored by this applesauce. And I had added some frozen blueberries to it. And she's like, this is so good. She's like, I wish my mom would make this. Huh. You know, but like we- we forget that like, those are things now that we just take for granted. And my little one, she was like, mom, can you put some applesauce in my lunch? Cause I want to take it and show my friends like though, right. Instead of just buying applesauce off the shelf and opening up the top of it, like there's, there is something to be said about knowing where your food came from and knowing how it was made. And I think specific like DoorDash and, um, uh, the like shopping, uh, you know, all of those, like we are hands off of food. Now I still like to go to the store. I like to touch my fruits and vegetables. I like to pick out the ones that I want, but now we're just, we've moved into a space. Like you said, like our children don't know what that is. And they just pick up the bags from the front step that somebody delivered. And then they bring it into the kitchen and, you know, yes, convenience, we're all busy, but at the same time, there really just is something to be said about that whole entire process. Um, yeah, from know. start to I, finish. I'm passionate about that. <laughs> yes. and, no, it's extremely yeah. rewarding from start to finish. And for me, seeing, you know, working with people on an individual basis and seeing like where they start and being going mm -hmm. from zero to 10 over time, 
is fulfilling for me. It's part of my life mission and my purpose to assist Amazing. people in their health health journey. And yeah. again, you know, it's far beyond food. I also teach yoga. I'm a personal trainer. So I like to incorporate movement too. We have a lot in common mm -hmm. and, you know, just doing this great work in the world. So you're a mother, I'm not a mother, so I can't relate to that, <laughs> but I would love for you to talk a little bit about what that's like and, in dealing with children and communicating with children and trying to leave your legacy or just some yeah. good information that they can take out into the world and share with their <laughs> friends in a way that's not pushing an agenda or forcing them right. to, to do something. So let's talk yeah. about how moms can help their kids be healthier. Oh my gosh. A huge passion of mine, huge passion of mine. So I have two girls. I have a 25 year old and a 10 year old. Um, I would never, I would never think that <laughs> you're only like 35. Come on. Yeah, I wish I wish. Um, <laughs> but also too, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be a grandma. My oldest is expecting. So I have talk about a legacy. I really have, um, you know, so many, like so many things. So my oldest, she was with me when my health journey started. We would go to McDonald's together. We would order pizza. Um, and it's interesting because she still, as much as I changed, she has pretty much stayed the same and her habits. Um, when I come to visit, it's entirely different. She'll, you know, have the fruits and vegetables and, you know, she has me cook, you know, so that we can get that, those things in, but her, her taste buds have pretty much stayed the same and she has continued in that path. She knows better because my little one, um, she will be like, mommy doesn't want you to eat that. So, you know, like she'll give her something different. And my little one doesn't argue because that's what she was brought up with. She was brought up with, um, the changes um. and the whole food. And so she knows, and she'll tell me, she'll be like, mommy, you know, my oldest, she'll like, be like, Hilla had, you know, my McDonald's today. And, she, it's so interesting because she will try the food and she doesn't like it. She doesn't like to go through drive throughs She doesn't like to like eat even like restaurant chicken tenders and chicken, chicken nuggets. Like she's, she's never been that because we always, one of the rules for me was when I was pregnant with her, I was well into my, um, you know, my health journey by that time one of the rules was when she's like, she's going to eat what we eat. There's going to be no children's meal. There's going to be, you know, none of this. She's going to eat what we eat. And what a difference it made because she, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to stay home. So I did make most of her food, mm -hmm. um, which is, I wish I knew this when I was, you know, had my oldest, it's so easy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is so easy. It's a matter of steaming sweet potatoes and blueberries and like putting them together. Right. Um, but that is one of the, one of the big, uh, things that I think we miss a lot is that we separate, we have children's meals and then we have our adult meals mm -hmm. where in actuality, they need to see us. Um, they need to be eating the same thing as us, because if it's as good enough for us, it's good enough for them. Right. And so to be able to make that connection, that's where that um, connection comes in at dinner time is eating the same thing. Um, however, I do not think it is too young to bring your child into the kitchen with you. My little one was chopping potatoes. Um, I got her a little kit from Amazon. They're like, um, you know, plastic serrated, but they chop. Um, she has been, I got her a stool and she has been beside beside me for, you know, ever since she was two cutting, chopping, she goes to the grocery store. I'll tell her to go pick out radishes. She knows what radishes are, um, you know, Brussels sprouts. She know what the, she knows what those are because I've involved her and she helps me make the grocery lists. Um, you know, so those are things that I do daily just incorporate. And for me, it's normal. What I do for moms who are just starting out, who don't know where to start, because that can be very, very intimidating, um, is to sit down, pick a certain amount of time, you know, five, 10 minutes, set your timer, um, and g pick a letter from the alphabet A to Z and try to find either a fruit or vegetable that goes with that letter. Then take your child to the store so they can go with you. You're going to go hunt for that fruit or vegetable. And then the next step you could, because a lot of us go to the store and we pass by certain fruits or vegetables because we don't know what they are. So we just like, we ignore them, right? We just pass by. 
this is your opportunity to learn with your child and to dive in and do a Google search of the specific fruit or vegetable and what are the best ways to cook it. And you are learning with your child. I cannot say enough, one of the best things to do to learn is to also teach, right? Mm -hmm. And when your children, also too, let me just say that this has to be on a night where you don't have soccer practice in half an hour and you only have like 20 minutes in the kitchen, right? Because everybody's going to be stressed. So make this on the weekend when you have enough time so that it is enjoyable. Um, But really like go into that with your child. And then you also get to do the next steps and be like, hey, on a scale of one to 10, do you like this? How do you mm-hmm. feel about this? Would you buy this again? Right? Because then what you get to do at that point is you get to add to your family's um, list of things you like or things you don't like. And you also then are encouraging your family and your children to have an open conversation about food. Instead of just saying, you have to finish the food on your plate exactly. and call it like- a day. Like, like I'm sure our generation of parents and grandparents yes. did to us, right? And with, yeah. with punishments. <laughs> right. And Ooh. like, how threatening is that? So we want this to be an open conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so much to be said too, about just touching the fruits and vegetables. I think we forget, right. That like touching the fruits and vegetables, knowing what it looks like prior to it being on our plate and just saying here, eat it. Mm-hmm. is different. And yeah. I always, I always like to have the children, my daughter, whomever I'm cooking with, try it raw and cooked because fruits and vegetables, you can eat raw. <laughs> you don't have to cook them all. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Even, pota- even potatoes, you can eat raw, like mm-hmm. raw sweet potatoes are so good. Right. I, I um, know they are. Yes. And so try that. And then say, okay, now this is what it's like cooked. What's the difference, right? And what we're doing in that too, is we just are really opening up a language dialogue. We are really um, instilling confidence in our children too, because then what happens around the dinner table, we get to have a whole different conversation and we can say, oh my goodness, you know, tell so-and-so you tried this raw. What did it taste like? Was it crunchy? Was it, you know, Um, so those those are conversations that I know we're not having enough and that are really um those those are conversations that your child is going to learn so much from, even if you did it just once a week, um, you know, and picked one day. But those are my favorite things to do. <laughs> and I'm laughing because I do it with my adult uh my adult clients. So I love the, yeah. the idea of making food fun and engaging yeah. all of your, your senses. And there's a tactile component. I started a garden recently, so I'm really it. embracing that. But a lot of adults don't even know what certain uh, vegetables are, especially when I go shopping and I'm planning their meals and they're mm-hmm. like, what is that? Yeah. So part of my homework for my clients, like whether I work with them once a week or I'm cooking for them, same thing. Like, you know, let's identify one new vegetable Let's, you know, find a standard American diet meal that you're accustomed to, make some swaps, work on that yes. one recipe, you know, report back to me. How do you like it? Try to engage all of your senses. If I'm cooking at their homes, for instance, like I'll have them try the kale. Okay, it's bitter, it's fibrous, you know, and then now let's massage it or steam it and transform it and see how it tastes. Because a lot of people have the idea that this or that is nasty, even as as an adult, exactly. not even a child. I'm not going to eat it. I don't like it. I never liked it. I don't like the way my parents made the Brussels sprouts. So it's so important even, you know, with adults to begin to introduce them to this openness and yeah, yeah, to involve all of their senses, to try the before and after product, to have the conversations with their families. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that it could be challenging. Obviously you're working with moms and maybe sometimes the children don't abide and you have some great solutions, but do you also come across, and I know I do in my practice, uh, people make maybe making excuses or maybe it's a real life struggle that, okay, like I want to eat a certain way, but for the last 15 years, I've been taking care of X amount of children and my husband, (laughs) he makes fun of me and he's not on board and this is going to break up our relationship. So I would love to love to hear your solutions when it comes to that, because it's pretty common. it's so common. And it's interesting because I actually have two clients right now. I have one who, um, and both of their husbands are exactly the same, right? They are kind of stuck in the way that they are. And what they have both told me is, um, they, they're difficult to cook for. My one client is like, well, 
this is what I'm making. And he can fend for himself if he doesn't like it because she knows what she has done is she has moved to making, like you said, healthier swaps to meals that they've been cooking. It's not like she's bringing in, you know, like these crazy things. Um, if he doesn't like it, he can fend for himself or he can do this. And my other client is like, finds herself stressing over it almost every single day. So what she's doing is she's doubling the work because she has, she's making something for mm -hmm. herself and then she's trying to make something for him. And it gets very frustrating for her. So I am, um, it's interesting because also as an emotional eater, I feel like a lot of us are people pleasers too, right? And so we're like, and food is very easy to do that with, right? Like, oh, here, you know, let me feed you. Um, and so as a people pleaser, to have confidence in using our voice is something that we're not common, like it's not common for us and we're not used to. And so one of the ways that I like to let the women know is you are using your voice. It doesn't have to be audible, right? But when mm -hmm. you are sitting down with your plate at your table and you are saying, my body deserves this food, my body needs this nourishment because I want to feel good. I want to have the energy. I need to be able to play with my grandkids. I want to be a better wife. I want to be a better mother. All of those things, that is a way of us being able to use our voice and knowing that if I'm eating this, then it's good enough for the rest of my family. And Love they that. get to come along the journey, right? But also like there it's, I think that's one of the hardest things for me to express too, is like using our voice, but in a plate of food. Right. right. So <laughs> setting boundaries and sometimes yes. silence speaks louder than words, but not only that, yeah. what popped into my head is that women in general, we might be people pleasers, but we're used to playing the role of caregiver, mm. making sure everybody else's needs are met. So it's yeah. also an example of self-love, self-care and self-worth. I am worth improving my health. Mm. I am worth yeah. eating the way that I deserve to eat to improve my health, to improve my life, to nourish once again, this temple, this vessel that is guiding me through life. So I think yeah. that leading by example, and sometimes through the process of osmosis, people begin to pick up on your energy, whether it's your friends, your acquaintances, your coworkers, or your family members, and they see yeah. the changes beginning to happen, not just physically and emotionally, but energetically. And it's almost yeah. like, let the curiosity begin to emerge and allow people to ask you, what are you doing differently? Or is, maybe there's yes. something to that kale salad. And, you know, there's so much room for creativity too. And I like yeah. the fact that you mentioned that when working with children or adults really, and asking them, did you enjoy this? How yeah. did you like that? Honoring that people are autonomous beings. We all have free will. We all have specific preferences. We have to find what works for us. There's no one size fits all. So just being really open, but really taking care of ourselves first, putting ourselves, uh, you know, above all to make good choices and kind of hope that like that will ripple out like a wave yeah. out into the world and affect other people. Yeah. And sometimes it's not even, you know, like you don't have to do like a whole overhaul of everything, right? Mm -hmm. If it's just like, guess what? This one week, we're going to add one more vegetable to dinner. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm choosing. If you don't like it, please let me know what you would like instead, right? right? Or like, let's have a conversation because like you said, like I am making an investment in myself and this is what I know is good for me. Therefore, I'm spending 10 minutes on Sunday to plan my meals for the week. I'm more than happy to, you know, have your input. Otherwise, <laughs> this is what we're doing. But um, for me as well, so I'm 50 now. Um, I have like the women who come to me are give or take five years, either side of that. Right. And we, like you said, this is what we've done our whole entire life yeah. <laughs> is we have taken care of others. It's, it's a very uncomfortable place to be in. First of all, um, to set boundaries, but we can do it. And there is a way to be able to do it as well. And I love that food also too allows so many creative so many creative ways right to be able to do that and explore um 
and flex, right? Flex and flow yeah. with, with the food <laughs> and with the season, like seasons too, right? Like summertime is coming. That's one of my favorite seasons because the, the fruits and the vegetables are so delicious and to be able to explore different things then in the winter time. So you get, it doesn't have to be the same every single day you get to, you get to explore and then add to your repertoire as, as your skill, um, develop, then you get to add to it and you get to feel like a rock star in the kitchen. Exactly. And all you need, all you need is a growth mindset and yes. all you need to believe that is anything is possible. So you're currently 100%. living in New Jersey, right? So did you yes. grow up in yes. Canada or how long oh. did you spend <laughs> well, in Canada? So that's, yeah, that's an interesting thing. So I was born in Canada. My parents actually were missionaries in Kenya, East Africa. Oh, So I lived there for nine years and then uh, moved to the U S I came to school here. So I moved here when I was about 21. So I've been here, um, all that time. I, what I do say is because I had the exposure to so many different flavors and foods and fruits and vegetables living in Africa, I feel like that has really helped me be open to so many different things and also to, um, not be afraid of trying things <laughs> because I do have like that experience, um, as well and different spices. So I've been drawing on that a lot, um, with what I'm cooking at home. And then also to just introducing my clients to foods that they would have never, never tried before. What was the culture like around food and community when you were growing up in that environment mm -hmm. then in Africa? Yeah. So in, in same thing, eating was like a whole day affair. It was a celebration. Meal times were sacred. And so, uh, my parents lived at a, worked at a boarding school. So I was fortunate to be able to live on campus with them. I didn't have to go to a boarding school, but, um, and then we lived in the middle of, um, the mountains in the Swahili tribe. And so we became very close with the the natives that lived there and we would go to their homes and we would sit in their huts and a meal, like you don't go for an hour <laughs> no 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 it's like it's all day bless you um hmm. you know and so that was i think that was just part of kind of how that was to then like that's where I grew up knowing that. And then there's never a like throwing a temper tantrum because you don't want to try something. Right. That like you you never ever saw that. And so it was just like, okay, either no thank you, or you take a little bit of it and you try it and then you just leave it on your plate. So, you know, all of that was different, different as well. Um yeah. So <laughs> and with all your experience. Sorry, go ahead. No, and I was just gonna say, and they're nothing compares to being able to pick, um, fruit straight from the, oh, straight yeah. from the trees, right? Like that's not even, <laughs> that's so amazing. yeah, it's my, it's my wish that everybody can have a garden. You know, like I said, I'm yes. new at this. I just started it, but it's life altering. And I wish that all schools would teach children how mm. to do it and that everybody yeah. would have the opportunity and the chance. So, you know, you, you've had a lot of life experiences. You've been on mm -hmm. this journey. We're all on a journey. What were some of the biggest takeaways when it comes to just improving your health, losing the weight, getting on the path, finding your purpose and helping mm -hmm. people? What were some of the biggest life lessons or maybe lesson? Yeah. You know, that that's probably like a whole, <laughs> you know, you could talk about that for a whole day. That's so another thing, any yeah. kind of, <laughs> um, one thing that I have learned and I still have to do this every single day is give myself grace. I am not perfect. I never will be. And I have things as part of my experiences that will continue to come up. Um, but I think we don't give ourselves grace enough and we are very hard on ourselves. And that's where the failure comes in. And that's where the beating up comes in. I could have, I should have, I would have, right? Instead of saying, you know what? Today was a lesson. And this is what I learned from it. I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And this is what I'm going to focus on. 
right? Mm, I love um, yeah, we just, gratitude has been a huge piece. I know you can understand that, but um, mm -hmm. gratitude has re really been a really big part of my health journey, but I also want to say of my healing journey too, um, because there are so many things that we're grateful for that we don't recognize every single day. And when we can just go inside ourselves, which is probably one of the hardest things to do, but when we can go inside and find the things that are there that we can be grateful for, it changes our outlook and it changes how we treat ourselves and then also how we treat others. So grace is... Grace will always be one of my, my things and one of um, what I practice daily because I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect, but I, I certainly want to continue in the path of feeling amazing and what that looks like. That was so beautifully stated, grace and gratitude. That could be an episode right there. Oh, um, yes, it totally could. <laughs> I, I've been practicing gratitude for a long time. It's helped me tremendously. Yeah. I actually have a gratitude journal. I know it sounds woo woo, but seriously, just coming back to it, if you're feeling like yeah. shit, if things aren't going your way, yep. if you know, you're going to focus on what's not going right and, you know, take this downward spiral into, you yeah. know, the depths of darkness, then a simple act of writing specifically what you're grateful for, feeling yes. the feeling and just recognizing that. You know, it's a mindset shift. It's a perception. What right now can I be totally in awe of? What can I just have so much respect for? And there's so many things that are happening for me and not to me. So let me get myself back on track. It might be difficult for somebody hearing us speak of gratitude if they're in yeah. a really dark place, but I've been in many dark places. I've struggled so many times throughout mm -hmm. my life. I've experienced a lot of trauma and I can say that that simple mindset shift and yeah. focusing to choosing to focus on something other than what's not working is super helpful in raising our vibration and attracting more of what it is we're seeking. 100%. Absolutely <laughs> love it. And even if it's even if it's just one thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where you say I am grateful for and you write that in. That's something that you do every day and the reason why I do it every day is I'm sure you as well is because when we do something every day consistently, we're training ourselves, we're training our brain to think that way instead of like kind of all over. So it's been helpful for me, even on those, like you said, those dark days, those days where I'm like, you know what? I just don't want to, um, to be able just to sit for a minute and say, Hey, you know what? I've got a lot to be grateful for here. <laughs> And there's a, there, there is a science behind it. And I love to mm -hmm. listen to the affirmations that play for like 60 minutes or two hours. Yes. So if you're not a person who wants to take pen to paper, or you think that's a waste of time, you can be doing dishes or cooking or yep. building your confidence <laughs> in the kitchen and multitasking because it gets deep down into the subconscious. And like, you really yeah. begin to feel differently when you apply it on a daily basis. Okay. Yes. So clean eating with Christy K with the clean K with the Christy. Yep. Talk a little bit about the programs that you offer, how people can find you, how they can work with you before my concluding question, just put the information <laughs> out there. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, clean eating with Christy K and a K um, keep it simple. Instagram is a really great way to find me. And that is my handle on Instagram, clean eating with Christy. I share in my stories, I share a lot of just my daily cooking and things that happen at home as a mom and soon as a grandma, um, you know, those things. And then I have a signature program. It is called kitchen confidence. And it is an eight week program that leads you through the basics of the kitchen, um, going through your pantry, setting up simple meals for you, five steps of meal prepping so that you can have the systems that you need to move forward to your um, to your health goals. And then I also have one on one coaching as well. If that is something that you're looking for, then we dive deep. Um, we talk mindset, just like we've all, you know, we've been <laughs> doing. Um, we get to know your likes and your dislikes, and you're going to be um, excited about how food can truly, truly change your life. Um, and then my website, cleaningwithchristy.com. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you're, is you're speaking. Like you're state. speaking my language. <laughs> yeah, so, anybody listening to this, it's probably gonna air sometime in June. If you resonate with Christy, definitely feel free to reach out. 
She has a wealth of knowledge. She's been doing this for a long time. <laughs> You're an amazing human being. I know we only met today, but I, I feel like this there's going to be future collaborations. Yes. Um, last but not least, I like yep. to end each episode and ask my guests when you hear the term free flowing health, what does it bring up for you? Mm. What does it mean for you? Ah, free flowing health. I feel like it means endless. Like there's no, uh, there's no timeline on it, but it's just like really just ebbing and flowing. And for me, that means seasons. I'm going into a brand new season now of my life, um, being a grandma and also to like, what does that mean? And so to have that open mind. I, I love that. And I, I still can't <laughs> believe you're going to be a grandma. So. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> so everyone out there, make sure that you find some confidence in the kitchen. You find ways to make everything more efficient, find a way to make it fun, do it with grace and with gratitude. And, mm. you know, thank you so much, everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Christy, for sharing. Is there any last words that you'd like to impart onto our audience before we end this? Do not be afraid to take the first step. The first step is absolutely what you need to do. And, um, and then give yourself grace as you go and you've got it. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Christy. Thank you so much for tuning in to the free flowing health podcast. Your support means the world to us. Help us grow by leaving a positive rating and review. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. If you'd like to stay connected, you can find me on social media at Free Flowing Health or visit my website directly, freeflowinghealth.com. Wishing you a happy, healthy, and fulfilling life. Till the next time. This podcast is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only and should not be considered legal, health, or professional advice. We are not responsible for any losses, damages, or liabilities that may arise from the use of this podcast. This podcast is not intended to replace professional or medical advice. Views and opinions expressed by the guest are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the view of the host 